Robot Talk is the podcast that sits down with robot enthusiasts from around the world and asks them the questions you always wanted answered. Like, how can robots work together? And how does that thing work? Hello, everyone. Welcome to Robot Talk. I'm your host, Claire Asher, and this week's episode is about how multi-robot teams can be used to monitor messy outdoor environments, from farms to forests. But first, I'd like to remind you to subscribe to Robot Talk through your favourite podcast provider to make sure you're the first to hear the latest episodes. Another way to find out about new episodes is the email newsletter, which you can sign up to by going to robottalk.org. So, without further ado, let's get on with this week's interview. I recently had a really interesting chat with Pratap Tokikar from the University of Maryland about how teams of robots with different capabilities can work together. This week, I'm speaking to Pratap Tokikar, an associate professor at the University of Maryland, whose work focuses on environmental monitoring using multi-robot teams. Hi Pratap, welcome to Robot Talk. Hi Claire, thanks a lot for inviting me. It truly is a pleasure to be here. So you're working on multi-robot teams that are made up of different types of robot with different features and capabilities. Um, So how do you get these diverse teams to collaborate effectively together to collect interesting data from the environment? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And there really are two parts uh, to the question. What's interesting data in the first place, right? Mm. Uh, So how do you determine what is it that the robot should be collecting that's actually going to be useful uh, for someone? Uh, Humans are pretty good at it, especially domain experts are pretty good at knowing uh, where should you go and collect data from that's going to give you the most bang for buck, if you will, right? Mm. Uh, So if I have only limited opportunities to collect the data, experts, domain experts, use their expertise uh, to know, given this environment, given this layout, oh, here are 10 most interesting locations I should go and get data from that when I then go back to my lab and analyze, I'm going to get the the most informative set of data. Uh, So the first question that we kind of look at is uh, if instead of humans, we have robots that are collecting the data, how do you analyze the data that you are recording in real time to then determine uh, where you should obtain your measurements from or where you should collect the data from uh, that then once you've collected is going to give you the most interesting set of data. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so now if you have a team of robots, this problem sort of uh, becomes even harder uh, because each robot may have only access to what it is seeing. So now robots need to share information with each other and then collectively decide, uh, hey, I should be sort of collecting data here. You should go and collect data over there so that we are collectively gathering the most interesting information. In some cases, you can you can quantify uh, the informativeness of the data that you're collecting. So, for example, Let's say you want to record the the temperature uh, in a particular area, right? So you would go Mm. to a few locations, record the temperature there, and then use that to predict the temperature in other places, right? Uh, So with temperature, for example, we know that the temperature, if I make a measurement here, and if I go to a point that's not too far from where I just measured, the temperature there is not going to change too much. Uh, yeah. So in, in in some cases, there's some natural uh, sort of way of encoding how informative a measurement is going to be. Uh, but that's not always the case. So what we look at is uh, using sort of both machine learning techniques uh, as well as sort of classical optimization techniques to learn the informativeness of measurements. So can we, for example, look at how humans collect data and from that determine what would be a good path for my robots to go and collect data from? Right? So that's one mm-hmm area of uh, research that we do. Uh, And then now if you have a team of robots and especially a team of robots with diverse capabilities, uh, there you can uh, look at cooperation between the robots to perhaps do better than the sum of the parts. Mm. So I'll give you an example of a project that that we just uh, concluded. 
Uh, this was a collaboration with an environmental scientist who was uh, interested in studying chemical leaks in in water bodies like lakes and rivers and so on. Okay. And so what he was really interested in is uh, going and collecting water samples uh, in and around where the leaks are to then mm. sort of take the samples back and analyze uh, the chemical composition of the leak, right? Uh, so we developed a robotic boat to go and collect the samples from. Uh, the challenge was the boat itself is pretty slow uh, and it can only collect a limited set of samples. Mm. And each boat can only see what's around it only in its local vicinity. So then based on just the local picture, it's very hard uh, to determine what's the most interesting locations to sample from. So this is where we brought in some heterogeneity. So what we did was we also introduced aerial robots or drones uh, Mm -hmm. that can quickly scout an area and then uh, sort of build a quick map of what's actually happening and then use that to guide the robotic boats to go and sample at specific informative locations. Uh, So this way you can sort of bring in uh the the diverse capabilities that you have but boats we can actually collect samples aerial robots you can only fly but you can cover large areas in quick time and have Mm -hmm. the team uh sort of overcome individual limitations to do better than the sum of the parts so that that's really what drives uh, the research that we do yeah when i think about kind of heterogeneous teams the most obvious is kind of ground or I guess in this case water-based and then aerial is that kind of the most common sort of pairing you have? Uh, So that's the most common pairing but sometimes you may even have heterogeneity amongst uh, aerial robots for example Mm. you might have some that are smaller some that are larger uh, or some uh, that have more capable sensors uh, whereas others may be more limited in their onboard sensing Mm. capabilities so we still look at how can sort of this team of all aerial robots, but but with still heterogeneity in terms of their capabilities, their features, their sensing, collaborate with each other. So, for example, we've looked at cases where you can have a few larger aerial robots uh, essentially act as communication or computation hubs for mm. smaller robots that can go to uh, sort of hard to reach places where your larger robots may not be able to go. Uh, yeah. So so imagine, if you will, a network where you have a few of these larger aerial robots uh, that are talking to these smaller robots that are going to hard to reach places, collecting data, relaying it back to your larger robots that are doing the computation and communication, and then sort of helping guide the other robots. So we've also looked at heterogeneity in terms of capabilities and not just in terms of form factors. Mm. Uh, broadly speaking, I think like the community as a whole we are barely scratching the surface in terms of heterogeneity. Even yeah. like deploying just one robot is hard enough. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So now if you add sort of multiple robots and, and especially heterogeneous robots in the field, things just become uh, sort of exponentially harder. Uh, yeah. But that's where we, we think we can really unlock a lot of what we can't do with, with single robots uh, by bringing in this, this, this teaming aspect uh, between the robots. Yeah, I guess the the possibilities are kind of endless. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a a related question uh, submitted by an audience member on the website. Uh, So this is a a question from Swanadip. He says, I want to know about technologies for achieving consensus in robot swarms. Yeah, that's that's a great question. Uh, And consensus is sort of one of those uh, canonical problems that people have studied uh, in Mm. terms of robot swarms for several years. Uh, So just broadly, the idea in consensus is you have a a team of robots, a swarm of robots. Each one has its own local view, uh, but you want to arrive at a common decision, uh, so achieve consensus with each other. So for example, uh, you can think of flocking where you have a bunch of robots, but you all want to decide on one direction that you need to fly in. Uh, but you mm. need to do it based on only local information. Uh, the general idea in consensus often is um, to trade off computation for communication. So for example, if all my robots could talk to each other, so then I could just have a global view uh, and mm. then I could solve a giant optimization problem and then pick a direction and then we are done. But here, what we want to do is instead of having one computer that's making a decision for everyone, we want each robot and its own onboard computation to make a decision that's in consensus with the others. So uh, a common technique that's often employed is what you do is you 
pick a decision and you talk to your neighbors and tell your neighbors, hey, this is the direction that I want to move in. Your neighbors are also going to do the same. They're going to tell the direction that they want to move in. Uh, and so then what you do is you take all of your neighbor's information and then update your decision to be more in line with what your neighbors are doing. Mm. Each of the robots is doing the same thing. And you do this for a few rounds of communication. So you talk, you update, you talk, you update. And oftentimes we can show that with enough rounds of communication, we will all converge on the same decision. And that's commonly what's uh, used for consensus-based algorithms. Uh, mm. More recently, we sort of started looking at what if you don't have enough time to keep doing this back and forth, if I have yeah. to decide within only two seconds, uh, so I can't afford to keep going back and forth, can I still achieve consensus or at least achieve almost consensus? So I might not arrive at the same decision, but I'm still sort of mostly consistent with what the others are doing. So we have some some recent work uh, looking at that, where if I have limit on how much I'm allowed to talk to my neighbors, I can still optimize and achieve a near consensus. Yeah, when I'm thinking about consensus in robot swarms, I always I can't help but think about um, honeybees and the the waggle dance where they will you know dance to each other to reach a consensus about where to to move their their colony to. Yeah, so there's there's a lot of especially in the consensus uh, literature, there's a lot of bio inspiration that comes in because yeah. the birds uh, more generally are are very good at sort of arriving at uh, a common decision. Uh, without employing the same sort of engineering uh, methods that we are. Mm. And so so a lot of work in this area uh, sort of takes inspiration from biology. Uh, often you deviate from how exactly birds do it, but you want to reach the same goal. Uh, yeah. So that's driving a lot of the research. You're sort of inspired by nature uh, to to achieve the same things, but using sort of engineered systems uh, where you can exploit maybe some sort of additional capabilities that perhaps birds don't have. For example, here uh, we can maybe increase the, the the power for my radio so that I can talk to not just my immediate neighbors, but, but talk further away. Uh, mm. So we can sort of these engineering knobs that we can play around with, but we're still inspired by, by biology over here. Yeah, fascinating. Um, so you really work at the intersection of robotic software and hardware. So you write your own algorithms and design and build your own robots. And I know a lot of roboticists tend to kind of specialize in one or the other of those. So like, what are the advantages and disadvantages of, of really developing these systems from the ground up? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, so first, I think it's important, uh, just like we talked about diversity in, in robots, I think it's also important to have diversity in terms of approaches uh, mm. to solving these problems. And uh, I think it's important to have researchers who are hardware first, researchers who are software first, and perhaps researchers who are trying to, to close the loop between hardware and software. Uh, yeah. Because we need like, new uh, capabilities that may come from new hardware designs, new systems. Uh, that can then drive the the new sort of software that we are developing, but we also need like good softwares to unlock uh, the potential that we have from hardware. So in in that sense, it's actually a great time to be doing robotics because uh, with all the recent investments, we are able to come up with sort of both great actuators for robot. Uh, we have sort of great sensors for robots, great computation uh, for robots. So we are sort of mm. advancing hardware, but then with all the developments happening in AI and in machine learning, we are also yeah. able to exploit all of that in terms of software. Uh, coming back to sort of my uh, group, what we tend to do is we, we tend to develop algorithms and develop software implementations for those algorithms that are grounded by specific applications. So almost think of it as uh, an application pull, if you will, where you have mm. needs of certain applications that driving the, the algorithmic research that we are doing. The reason why I like this is oftentimes uh, when we develop algorithm, we make certain assumptions that may not hold uh, when you deploy your algorithms in the field. So you really yeah. need to <laughs> actually run your algorithms on hardware in the field, mm -hmm. uh, in the settings that you actually want to uh, be running this on. 
to understand the limitations of your uh, of your work but but even beyond that uh, what this can do is it can actually open up interesting new algorithmic or software research problems that you may not have thought of if you hadn't deployed your systems in the field mm. uh, so for example uh, over the last five or so years my group has been looking at risk aware planning and we arrived at this because uh, when when i started my group we were deploying our systems we had algorithms that that worked really well in simulation where we had good theory backing our algorithms but we run them on actual hardware and we realized oh okay instead of my robot running at 0.5 meters per second it's actually running at 0.55 meters per second <laughs> uh, but that sort of minor change mm. is really throwing off the entire system especially if i have a team of robots uh, that needs to precisely coordinate with each other yeah. and so that really sort of made us uh, think that we could we could come up with hacks to try to patch this specific issue but maybe there is a broader algorithmic question here uh, mm. where we need to be robust to all of these parameters that may not be what you expect uh, them to yeah. be when you deploy in the field uh so what we've been looking at over the last few years is is coming up with algorithms that take the risk of these values these parameters not being what you thought they were uh into account when we are planning our system so even if it turns out it takes you a little longer to reach that's not suddenly going to make my system sort of uh, break down uh, mm. so we're taking that kind of risk into account and that's actually led to sort of very interesting theoretical work that we wouldn't have otherwise gotten to if we weren't trying to complete the loop like ideally it would be something where i take something that works in theory without any changes i make and make run it in in the real world that's not the case there's still a big gap uh yeah mm. sort of trying to bridge the gap but that's this is sort of a lifelong pursuit in some sense yeah sure <laughs> Coming back to kind of the applications of of your work, um, we had an audience question from Hunter on Twitter. Uh, Hunter says, "What are some potential real world applications of robot swarms in environmental monitoring?" It's a it's a great question. Uh, so there are several applications, and and fun times uh, we we like to call them as the three D problems of uh, data collection for environmental monitoring. doing data collection manually can be dull uh, it's just boring sometimes uh, because you have to collect lots of data in very large mm-hmm. areas and doing it manually is boring uh, it can be dirty that's the second d uh, you might actually have to collect data from the swamp uh, or from <laughs> sort of hard to reach places where doing it manually is is just dirty uh, or it could be dangerous right if you're studying volcanoes for example uh, collecting data is sort of a mm-hmm. dangerous uh, task in and of itself so so monitoring tasks that have this features of dull dirty and dangerous are are sort of prime uh, candidates for uh, using robots for environmental monitoring uh, so in my research uh, we've we've looked at sort of uh, monitoring marine bodies for chemical leaks we've looked at wildfire monitoring this is an ongoing project uh, where we would like to use uh, a set of sensors and uavs uh, drones equipped with Uh, chemical sensors to go and detect wildfires and and do so uh, at an early stage so that we can then inform the mm-hmm. firefighters um, before too much damage has been done yeah. uh, there's sort of all sorts of wildlife or sort of marine life monitoring uh, so in my past we've looked at monitoring invasive species of fish uh, so this is collaboration with okay. fish biologists who are interested in how fish move uh mm. and we designed robotic systems to go track this fish as they're moving along uh, so that we can study their movement patterns uh and the fish biologists now can understand sort of uh, what drives fish to move in certain regions but the same research has then been applied for monitoring uh, other wildlife like bears uh there's work on monitoring penguins migratory patterns of birds so lots of okay. sort of um, wildlife and and marine life monitoring Uh, recently we've also been looking at like infrastructure uh, monitoring so monitoring railroads or bridges uh, or cell phone towers uh, monitoring them for for defects for cracks that you can observe visually with robots so instead of having humans 
go in these potentially dangerous environments like imagine having to sort of uh, manually inspect a bridge uh, you might mm. have to close down the bridge or close down a few lanes of traffic and then you need someone to to be suspended from the bridge to then go and see what's happening it's much easier to have a, a drone equipped with a camera to go out collect mm. high resolution pictures that you can then look for visual defects so another example of environmental monitoring over here so this is an example of dangerous sort of environmental monitoring so there's a lot of work that's being done in this area uh, yeah. we've we've looked at a few of these but uh, to to me this is a, a great application for robots that can automate this dull dirty dangerous uh, monitoring tasks yeah sounds like a really interesting kind of variety of projects that you get to work on yeah and this is sort of something that i really love about the job uh, that I sort of get to to work with people from completely different backgrounds uh, yeah. my i'm interested in robots i'm i want to see robots being uh, used out in the real world doing uh, not just cool things but also like important things uh, mm. but then i also get to work with uh, agronomists like people with completely different uh, training uh, work with civil engineers work with like biologists people i would normally have not spoken to uh, yeah. but i get to sort of talk to them uh, they have a very different perspective on on what uh, robots can and should do and it's it's great to have that interchange of ideas uh, and that's led to like, interesting research questions fundamental research questions for robotics uh, that have come from from these uh, applications that we wouldn't have otherwise thought of yeah so i know you're also applying um, robot swarms to agriculture so can you talk a bit about how multi robot teams are used in this area yeah so agriculture is is again a, a very important application for robots and in fact uh, this is this whole field of uh, precision agriculture the so precision mm. here is you want to do agriculture in a precise or a data driven fashion uh, so for example if you want to apply fertilizer instead of uh, sort of applying fertilizer uniformly throughout your farm if you really have data about what's happening in your farm you can target your fertilizer application you can apply it at the right time in the right amount at the right places and that can lead to tremendous environmental as well as cost benefits so there's a mm -hmm. lot of interest in in doing agriculture in this kind of a data driven fashion um, and the first step to do that is to collect the data and this is where uh, we've been looking at robots as data collection agents to support uh, precision agriculture uh, this is especially useful when you have really large farms as we do in the US uh, where mm -hmm. sort of doing this kind of inspection manually wouldn't be feasible uh, so we've been looking at uh, using both aerial robots drones equipped with uh, appropriate sensors as well as ground robots to go and collect this data that can then be used to form uh, sort of a health map of of your crops in the field uh, so specifically we've looked at uh, using drones for identifying nutrient defects so is sort of is your soil missing nitrogen or phosphorus mm. uh, things that you can observe if you can collect uh, infrared imagery multispectral imagery by flying right. above your crops uh, but then you can also identify for example diseases that might be afflicting your crops if you can go close to leaves and take close up uh, images of what's happening and oftentimes diseases result in different types of discoloration of the leaves so you can mm. then go and inspect what's happening with a ground robot uh we equip with a camera to then tell you sort of what's happening there you can uh, use uh, these to figure out uh, water deficiency like for example if you need to irrigate uh, what parts in your farm really need to be irrigated so again you can control your irrigation target your irrigation application in in a precise fashion Uh, so we've been working with uh, agronomists uh, for supporting this kind of uh, uh, data driven agriculture a lot of the work that we do uh, actually goes in support of agriculture researchers uh, who okay. are sort of coming up with new breeds uh, rather than actually deploying them in the farms to support farmers mm. but oftentimes for example if you are developing a new breed uh, you might want to collect lots of data or, during is the course of a season and this is where sort of we've been using robots to to support what is called as high throughput phenotyping 
Yeah, that's really cool. Um, do you hope to be able to kind of apply this to active farms in the future? Is that is that something that's on your kind of to do list? Yeah, absolutely. So th- I, I started sort of working in this area towards the end of my PhD, uh, which sort of now is uh, many years ago. Uh, <laughs> but after I graduated, there was actually a startup that came out of uh, my, my PhD lab uh, that was mm-hmm. headed by a colleague of mine and my advisor. And they recently got acquired by a big sort of uh, ag tech company, uh, okay. sort of looking at translating the research that we were doing into sort of into the field, into practice, uh, where this can be used by actual farmers. Uh, that specific application was looking at yield estimation. So essentially being able to predict how many fruits you are going to have uh, mm. at the end of the season, but doing that prediction at the start of a season uh, yeah. based on what you're seeing in the farm so that then you can control uh, like how many people do I need to hire like or sort of just doing inventory of sort of what your yield is going to be and so you can make uh, business decisions appropriately so this is sort of very much uh, an area where where robotics and broadly this technology can have an immediate impact and i would certainly yeah. uh, love to see the research that we are doing get translated into into the field mm mm-hmm. So to finish up, we have another audience question. Uh, This was submitted by Gaurav on the website, uh, who says, what is the future of swarm robotics? Ah, that's that's a great question. Uh, (laughs) Nice broad question. (laughs) Yeah, it's a a nice nice broad question. Uh, To me, there are two really sort of big things that it's both an immediate goal, but also something that's going to need a lot of uh, research that, that we might not be able to achieve next year, but it's you know, a long-term vision. Mm. Uh, the first one is sort of robustness. Uh, the systems that we are developing are just too brittle. When we develop the algorithms, we we design them in a way that they can work in nominal conditions. But if something changes, uh, maybe it's uh, a little brighter today uh, than... Yeah. The, the conditions that I develop my algorithms in, things just go haywire. So they're very brittle uh, like that. Being able to adapt to changes in the environment, changes in the conditions, uh, being robust to these kinds of changes, uh, mm. taking into account the context when you are making your decisions, it remains a big goal for robotics in general and, and Swarm robotics in particular. Swarm especially mm. so because... Uh, the brittleness sort of gets compounded by the number of sort of robots we have, where if one fails, maybe everyone fails, right? So taking that into account uh, mm-hmm. becomes important. Uh, the second broad theme that I think uh, is both of immediate research value, but also is a long-term goal is alignment uh, in the sense that oftentimes when we design our system, we design them to do a specific task. and that requires us to somehow mathematically encode what the task is. Mm. And we optimize our system, uh, trying to optimize that mathematical utility that we have, which might not actually be what we want our agents to do at a higher level. And so, for Mm. example, I was talking about data collection. Uh, I can maybe somehow encode the informativeness of data collection in some mathematical way and optimize my system for that. But the outcome of that might not actually be uh, the kind of data that I want to collect. Right. So this mismatch between what we want our team to be doing, what we want our swarm to be doing, versus what the swarm's actually doing, uh, still remains pretty high. Especially so for swarms, because uh, we are often talking about agents that have a limited view uh, with very limited compute on board. And so we often end up uh, taking these complex objectives and distilling it down into something that we can run on board. And that's where mm. the gap shows up. So being able to bridge that gap, uh, aligning what the agents are doing with the global objective, I think it remains uh, a big challenge. And, and to me, like these two things are really sort of where uh, the swarm research should be going, sort of alignment and robustness. Yeah. Absolutely fascinating area of research. Um, Pratap, it's been great talking to you today. I've been chatting to Pratap Tokikar from the University of Maryland. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy Robot Talk, 
I'd really appreciate it if you could share the podcast, subscribe, and leave a review. It really helps boost the podcast, so thanks in advance. And don't forget to join the Robot Talk community on Patreon. If you'd like to support the podcast and get access to some awesome perks, including behind the scenes updates and monthly bonus episodes, visit patreon.com forward slash Claire Asher to find out more. Next week, I'll be chatting to Gabriella Pizzuto from the University of Liverpool about robotic chemists to discover new materials. Until then, I've been Claire Asher, and this has been Robot Talk. Robot Talk is brought to you by the Hamlin Centre, Imperial College London.